All right, everybody. Welcome, welcome. It is four o'clock on the Eastern Seaboard of America, United States. That is. This is uh, Web Three by Three, Episode Forty Six. How Web Three is changing marketing. This show is dedicated to bringing the business insights around blockchain and how it affects the marketing world. I think this is uh, so. Real quickly, beyond the technology of blockchain and tokens, there's big change happening in the nature of marketing itself. We'll explore that shortly. I'm joined, as always, by my lovely co-host, Michelle Peterson-Clark. Hi, everyone. And Mike Neubauer. How's it going? All right. So I'm going to jump us right in here. Story number one comes to us from Reddit for Business. Uh, Michelle, this was your find, correct? Yep. The Future of Web3 Loyalty. This is a joint report released by several firms, including Reddit, Salesforce, and Polygon Labs, among others. Today, loyalty programs focus more on transactional rewards than they do brand affinity. That basically means that people are in it because they get stuff rather than because they love the firm. The value of marketing is going to shift as brands are increasingly expected to engage with their audience. And this means new models of collaboration and incentivizing will emerge. I'm sure all three of us have a lot of thoughts around this. Michelle, we'll start with you as it's your story. Thank you. Um, it was a, it's a really good um, article um, and, uh, sorry, it's a, it's a really good report. Sorry. Um, the link that I will post, you actually have to sign up um, and give your own name and email address in order to get the report. But I was looking at it before. It's around 35 pages, pretty um, in, you know, pretty full on in terms of the things that they're talking about. Um, I found it on LinkedIn um, through, I think it's Mark Bauer. Let me, oh, that's very clever. I'm trying to find my, uh, where I posted the original thing in our chat about that. But um, it was, um, it's really talking about a lot of the things that we've talked about over these, what are we now at week 46, um, where, where, um Community is at the heart of Web3 and the way in which brands need to build um, not just their Web3 businesses but their Web2 businesses as well is to look at community and um, to look at how they are going to build loyalty um, so that they can expand into Web3 but also have people continually um, promote them, support them, not just buy from them. It also talks about the fact that consumers have become much more um, uh, sophisticated, I guess is the word, about how um, they choose what brands to support. So, you know, like, for example, when uh, Adidas, Adidas supported Kanye when he did his Yeezy shoes, for example. Now, there was a whole group of people that flocked to Adidas because they were Kanye fa fans and they wanted Yeezys. Well, now they wouldn't touch him with a barge pole, Adidas or the people who may have bought them in that. Now, there's probably a few people that are still Kanye fans, but there's a lot of people that have been turned off by how his brand is actually functioning at the moment. And his community is not the com type of community that, that Adidas want anymore. Um, so there's those sorts of things that I think are, um, are an important way in which we can segue um, from Web 2 um, to Web 3 marketing and talking about community. But the other thing I think is really important too is that um, one of the spots in the report they talk about in another 10 years, we won't say Web 3 anymore. It will just be the web. Yeah. Mike, what do you think about the future of Web3 loyalty? How does this change marketing, et cetera? Well, first first things first, just to comment on that last comment, uh, I've never heard the term Web2 until Web3 came about. Right? Yeah, so that's right. Not, it wasn't Web1 not, either, was it? <laughs> no. So uh, this term Web3 is is you know a buzzword term that will fade away into the ether. Uh, pun intended. Um, look, I mean, I look at I look at the technology, and you know, I build a lot on this technology. I try to understand it the best I possibly can, um, and I look at it as nothing more than a traditional tool. 
And from a business perspective, you have multiple tools that you engage with your customers in. The whole point is to create interact interaction, um, brand awareness, brand loyalty, ultimately conversions in some capacity, whether it's joining a community, point of purchase, whatever the goal of the marketing strategy is. And the technology just provides a different medium to do that. Now, there's challenges and onboarding processes that have not been ironed out yet that is a challenge to some of these companies to execute these properly. But the technology foundation is in place, and I think we've seen a few models that prove the prove the concept. So it's, again, in my opinion, this isn't going anywhere. As far as consumers being able to pick and choose different brands and you know which brands are going to, to work and which ones are not due to specific messaging, I mean, you brought up Kanye. I would say Bud Light is more of a prominent example of that. Right. Yeah. So, you know, people can identify with products that they like, what they don't like and why. Um, but there's a cultural shift with the with the perception that those brands have in society. And the technology is irrelevant at that point. Now, if Bud Light came out and said, hey, we're going to offer loyalty in the, in the form of crypto. And, you know, we talked about PayPal being able to accept crypto and maybe you can go to a bar and start buying Bud Light with that crypto. I mean, this is a strategy that may pick up over time where these brands ultimately have their own ecosystem um, to be able to in, engage in, and exchange their customers for 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 the products. That's a use case down the road that is very, very possible. Um, I'm sure Visa and MasterCard won't like that too much because now it's taking the transaction fees out of their hands and putting them into gas fees. But again, this is where things can potentially move from the loyalty side of it. It's not all NFTs and apes and all these things that is, you know, is out there. We're starting to see that, you know, that that deli card that that we reference quite often is definitely a digital digital collectible, a digital component of any marketing strategy that a business can put forth. I want to comment on something that I think is being overlooked here. The expectations are changing of these brands, meaning your use cases are completely correct, Mike. I agree with everything out of your mouth. That's great. And, and they will discover the money end of it great, easy enough. But there's an obligation here that they're not realizing, they being the companies. Both the people and the firms in the world are now have different expectations of each other in a Web3, quote unquote, construct. So you've got brands that are actually becoming people. Right the, to your point about Kanye's, people expect a brand. If ever, way back in the day when there was like poison in the cyanide in the Tylenol, like the companies have to respond to that. Or if someone finds a finger in the food at Taco Bell, like this is the kind of stuff where these companies jump on social. Great, they're not doing that unless they have to right now. Damage control in a world of interactive, let's call it marketing. You're you need to have a voice, which means the companies have to have a defined personality. Literally, if Coca-Cola walked into a bar, what would he or she look like? Like that's what kind of a person is Nike? We're getting to that or that's what will happen over time. But this happens think- already. I mean, Com- you know, I, I'll reference the Simpsons on it. Right. So like look at the beer company from the Simpsons, Duff Beer. What do you Duff think beer. of the minute I said that? Uh, well, right? Homer, but yeah. Duff Man. Right. You know, Duff Man walks in. He's all of a sudden the brand personality of it. Right. Like the superhero type guy that, you know, everybody gets beer muscles when they drink Duff Beer. Um, You know, the mascots and that's all part of the marketing strategy. Right. And, you know, look, maybe maybe a token could be that identity, too. You know, it could be a generative form of that identity. You know, we've seen some of the things that Starbucks have done with those stamps. Like, you know, I'm sure the art selected with that was specific. It is an identity for that particular marketing strategy. I think many of the listeners and ourselves included have had at this point defunct tokens, right? Things that were around and now aren't. And I think that if you look back on what was the personality you could describe of why you got involved in that project, what was the general quote unquote personality? I think that companies need to dis- determine this now for themselves if they're going to try to attract real loyalty is the word. Well, loyalty comes with community too, right? So again, we can't dismiss that component, which is what we've already proven with the technology. But community is a two way obligation. Like, it's not just that you're a fan of the brand and the brand can expect you to buy their stuff. You now need to kind of prove yourself as a partner, if you will, of the people that are in your followership. Well, that's part of the engagement, right? What are you offering back to the brand other than conversion of the product or service, right? The promotion, the indirect promotion, the subliminal promotion, the interaction with different components that they're putting forth as part of surveys, games, you know, just different interactive tools. You see the brand at a local event that you attend, whether it's a fair or a football game or something, you go up and say, hey, I'm a big fan of this. Like these are the interaction components that are that two-way street as part of that community. 
And I think part part of it too is that, um, you know, like we all have, you know, there's so much these days that we can spend our money on. So discretionary spending or the things that we um, have, you know, decide that we're going to spend our money on, there's a lot of competition for that these days. So we're much more sophisticated about deciding what it is we're going to spend our money on. And that's why brands need to be a bit different, do things differently, stand out a bit more, um, you know, like treat us in a way that we're... Um, that we enjoy hanging out in the community of whether it be Nike or Adidas or, you know, not even them, you know, your little coffee shop down the road that has meetups every um, Wednesday for people who are book writers or, you know, fiction writers or poets, poets or, you know, that kind of stuff is what people are looking for because we're what we're also looking for, particularly after um, COVID, I think, is connection with people. You know, we're, for so long we were isolated from people and we couldn't see um, or do the things that we wanted to do. And so now people are much more discerning about that as well. So I think another aspect, by the way, to build on this, founder-led firms, whether you're publicly traded or not, will have an advantage because when you've got like them or hate them, Elon Musk has a personality or even better, like a Jeff Bezos, although he's not in charge anymore. <laughs> When you've got the, a Richard Branson at the front, you can rally behind that. When you've got a faceless entity like IBM, it's tougher. Yeah. Yes. So added that's, that. That's one ahead. of the most impressive comments that we get from the Battle Bunnies, right? Yes. The fact that Frank and Crystal Anatra are front and center in every discussion, yeah. all day, every day, available to the community, is not seen, right? And that's part of the community build that got us, you know, got Mark Schaefer to write you know, information about us in two books, right? Like, you know, do podcasts yeah. about us, right? Like this is the community build. The founder component of it is critical. And you, far too often we've seen, and maybe we'll get to the story later, but the hot air and the inflation of, you know, hype and FOMO that does not include founders, but people had that weird anticipation of not being able to participate in that little group think that led to these multi-million dollar projects that went nowhere. And you had no access to the founders and it didn't really have that community feel to it. But, you know, that that's such an important component to the brand and, and to the to the execution of whatever strategy you're implementing on the marketing side. Do you think companies are thinking that way, though? Um, I do. And I think social media has paved the way for that. Right. So, like, think about, you know, again, Twitter, you know, you can say what you want about it. Instagram, you know, how many people, you know, going out for a run in Nike shoes will tag Nike in their post of the sunset, and them running down the street. You know, if, if Nike liked that or commented and reposted that, you know, that made that person's day. They can go out and say, hey, I did something right. Nike actually paid attention to me. Now, it's some kid that Nike hired to handle their social media that day of the year. You know, it's just I'm intern. But it's the brand that, you know, is forever linked to that person's account. Um, so I do feel that that, pay, that path has already sort of been paved um, by these brands using social media to create somewhat of that personal touch. Now, how many posts did that person make and tag Nike that didn't get a response? I, I, you know, millions, millions right? So yeah. you, but every now and then yeah. you throw a little bone and it, yeah. it, it makes people it makes people think that they yeah. can have that, too. I think it's that like that I'm I'm a big West Wing fan, and one time I I tweeted something and tagged Alison Janey, who plays CJ Craig in the West Wing, and she liked my post and reshared it. Like I thought I, that was it. My life at that point was pretty <laughs> much complete. <laughs> you know what's funny is you expect that from small time influencers, let's call them people, you know, local small celebrities on the internet that you would know in the community. You don't expect that from like quote unquote big time celebrities. But big companies have to change their thinking. I, I disagree in this regard, Mike. I think the top of the corporate world, not at all aware of this. Insurance companies, legal companies, like they're going to have a really hard time building a community yeah. around Prudential. I, I get it. But like who is, you know, who's paying their insurance bill and is like, woohoo, I'm tagging Prudential in my post that I'm paying my insurance <laughs> bill. No, I disagree. I think you can build uh, a woohoo around any brand. 
any brand. I agree, but not in that capacity, right? Not in the use case of that. If it aligns with, you know, some of the things that Progressive did, for example, with all of the various different marketing channels that they did, whether it was the cavemen, whether it was Flow, whether it was any of the, I, I think they had but a few other drink, ones that- Red Bull makes carbonated drink. Like I, You said, okay, so we talked about the brand identity a minute ago, right? So if, if people can associate with that brand identity and that brand identity is the one that interacts with those people, theoretically a equals b b equals c a equals c right, right. so the brand is theoretically interacting with the user totally agree. so again if grimace from mcdonald's has a an instagram account and he started interacting with all the people that were doing that stupid meme a couple months ago with the purple shakes you know that that that's mcdonald's interacting with their customer base i i really think that the executives would definitely understand that I would love to see the data on how much money they made just from Grimace Shake sales because that meme probably brought them a hundred million dollars. Oh yeah, and purple dye went through the roof. I mean, it was it was nuts. I guarantee you, there's gonna be grimaces at at uh, Halloween. Yeah, for sure. So can I say it was uh, Mark Bauman, B A U M A double N on um, LinkedIn that um, shared the report. So I, which I have found, which was really good because I follow him. And the other thing I think is really important is that it's Reddit, Salesforce, Media Monks, and Polygon Labs collaborated on the report. So there's lots of data and there's lots of information in it about um, how those three um, are using community. And you know, obviously there's the, the at the moment the inroads to um, a lot of web3 experiences that people have is through nfts um, and so there's some discussion about how you can offer those um, you know experiences and you know token gating things and all of that to, for people um, and you know one of the things i think is really important to remember out of all of it is that at the end of the day there are people behind the customer credit card that sends you money um, and connecting with them and not just, you know, oh, we're looking for first party data about how they, you know, they clicked on the red blouse and then they went to the green skirt and then they went to the blue necklace, not that stuff. Because at the moment, large corporations, that's really what they look at. They go, oh, you know, the website hot zone is in the top right-hand corner, but we actually have all this real estate on the other side, so we've got to do something with that. That isn't what people in this space, people in Web3 and people who are getting more community-minded are actually looking for in their brand. It's not I that stuff. I, I, the- would, I would push back and say that most of those people that were successful in those projects also do not hold that business sense to understand that concept of it, right? If you look at most of the Web3 websites, for example, website used to be an essential tool, still is an essential tool to operating your business, mostly not only for access of information and points of conversion, but for analytics, right? Yes. So that, yeah. that is a component that completely got underlooked in, in Web3 and, and especially NFTs. NFTs were launched on the most basic of websites where oh, it was yeah. just a landing page and a mint button. Yeah. That was it. A couple bits of design here and there, uh, FAQ section. But you know, it, you, I feel like you miss a huge opportunity in combining the Web2 and Web3 worlds. And we talked about this, I guess, 45 episodes ago. People who are looking to go all in on Web3 are making a big mistake. It needs to be an integration right? A yes. merger, if you That's will, correct. into yep. the web two concepts of what already know what you already know works into what web three can provide in the future. Unless you just want to get rich quick, Mike. Well, then th- that's not what we're talking about here, right? I mean, you know, <laughs> the, the pet rock story can exist in Web 2, Web 1, and Web 3, right? But, you know, we're talking about building a sustainable business, having a, a marketing plan, a budget allocated for these types of technologies and interactive components with your customers. Mike, everything and, you just said doesn't exist from the companies that I'm talking about at the corporate world. In the Web3 space. Well, I, I, obviously, everybody wants the grand slam out of the gate, right, before the first pitch is thrown, right? That's the yeah. that's the goal. But when, when reality sets in and you actually have to raise capital and you have to figure out marketing budgets and you have to allocate these funds to hire people that, that sort of supposed to know what they're talking about and execute on a specific plan over a period of time, you have to understand that there's a specific ROI that comes short term, medium term and long term. And how long before you make that investment are you able to see some of that return back and get you into the black um, rather than being in the red on some of those expenses? So the last point, I'm going to shift it from the company's perspective that, yes, I do think that they're going to miss a lot of this. And you're right. Everything you say to the 
consumer's expectation. Most people today have a loyalty rewards program card, Starbucks, Dunkin' Donuts, whatever it may be, because they get free stuff, right? I can get a half price coffee, then nine coffees, 10th is free. That's not loyalty. That's free stuff. I agree. But most of those people get that without signing up for anything, right? They get it because they went randomly to a Dunkin' Donuts and they were like, oh, here, by the way, here's your card. And, you know, if you think about it, you go through drive through and you left it in your car from the last time. Oh, shit, I got this card. I'm going to throw it over this guy and maybe, you know, I'll get this. Nobody's rushing out to Dunkin' Donuts to sign up for their loyalty program. Yeah, that's the go to move. That's the go to move of these big companies is, well, what? what, let's just discount our stuff. Look at what Porsche tried. Like, you have to. Think buy nine of, cup, buy nine cups of coffee, get a tenth one free. Buy nine nine elevens, get the tenth one free. And so, like, you you have to think to yourself as a consumer, okay, why do I want to be part of this community, which is different from do I get an extra cup of coffee? I think people aren't there yet either. Starbucks, I would argue, is the only coffee place that created a sense of community, right? You're, you're talking before Web three. Before Web three, I agree, right? So, you know, like people were addicted to only going to Starbucks and I'm sure there's other fast food chains that are similar to that in certain regard, um, liking something and having a community built around that are, are not necessarily the same thing, right? You could love McDonald's chicken nuggets and want nothing to do with their marketing, nothing to do with their community. Just show up for the nuggets. Are you a part of the community or are you a loyal customer? That was the grimace shake. Seriously. Yeah, I I agree with you. I I think that people are buying these loyalty rewards cards, tokens now coming up because of the wrong reasons. It's also a cost and, uh, and, uh, you know, savings too, right? We have to factor that into these marketing expenses as well. These digital components, they don't cost as much as actually printing the real ones out, right? Distributing them, shipping them to the various locations. You know, this, this, this digital world that we're evolving into where everybody has this little device in their pocket that can access all these various tools and all these, the, all these little gimmicks, it's actually saving money from the consumer perspective um, on a lot of these overhead costs from the marketing side of things. Right. Interesting. All right. I'm going to take us to the next story, if that's okay with everybody. The uh, story number two comes to us out of Cointelegraph. This is Web3 is about solving business problems, not token prices. This is according to a Google Cloud executive. The crypto industry specifically is more focused on token price than on how smart contracts can solve real world business problems. This is according to Google's head of Web3, James Tromans. This guy's right out of your book here, Mike. Uh, Tromans says blockchain and smart contracts can lead to lower operational costs, new revenue streams, but thinks that blockchain tech will not see mass adoption until the user experience improves. I know you guys have thoughts on this stuff. So Mike, we're going to start with you because this seems pretty close to your world. Well, we've been, I feel like this is another, you know, echo of things we've been saying he forever. Hacked your, he hacked your computer. Yeah, or hack some of these podcasts. I don't know. But, you know, like there's specific things that are discussed, especially with with supply chain that I know we've discussed here in, in great yes. detail, right? So we talk about the user experience, right? The user experience from the effort or the strategy or the campaign that's put forth by the business. Now, let's take all that off the table and let's talk about an internal blockchain, right? We all have an operating business, Web 3 by 3 Inc., Okay, Um, Mark, you're in charge of sales. Michelle, you're in charge of uh, distribution. I'm in charge of production. Okay, so I produce something. I put my logs and everything that I need to in a blockchain file. That block is written on a specific chain that sticks within the company. Michelle, the product then lands on your your door. You have an SOP, a standard operating procedure of all these different pieces that you put forth on your link in the supply chain. All that is documented. Rather than sitting in a file cabinet or some Google Cloud storage system, it's all on chain. Mark, once it gets to you, you have your CRM, all these components that land on your lap with respect to what inventory is available. All that information is then you know allocated to the chain based around customer interaction, customer databases, et cetera. It doesn't mean that all this is transparent to the world. It's only transparent internally to our company. Now, let's fast forward 30 years. I'm retired. You guys got better offers and moved on to other, other gigs. You know, Whoever's in our respective positions have the entire lineage of the entire data set that's still on chain, right? We're not sifting through boxes of documents to find invoices or manufacturing records. If there's a callback or an issue with the product, We can trace back that product at every single step of the supply chain almost instantaneously. 
There is a complete operational infrastructure here that has not been utilized yet. But frankly, I think that was one of the primary purposes. And some of the books that I've read at the beginning of all this, that was really one of the main purposes of this of this technology and development. Michelle, what do you think about this Google exec's thoughts on Web3? Um, yeah, he... <sighs> I, when I was reading it, I was like, oh, deja vu, as, you know, Mike said before, you know, there's so many things about it that, that we've talked about. And, and in fact, he's the guy that said, you know, it won't be called Web3, it'll be called Web, uh, it'll just be the Web again. I got that confused. I thought it was in the other article. Read too many stories today for this podcast. It's We do so much research for our viewers, just letting everybody know. Um, I think that it will be an interesting thing for companies to start to look at how they can reduce and streamline some of their processes that Mike's talking about in that by using the blockchain and using Reb, uh, you know, using Web3 technology to be able to better analyze the types of products they need, the amount they need, how they're going to be able to distribute it, which you know, distribution centres need certain amounts based on, you know, they'll be able to analyse the previous years, the previous quarter, the previous months, all of those sorts of things. And in, in actual fact, I probably think we'll get to the point where there'll be AIs that will actually be able to spit out things and tell them what it is that they, they need to do. Now, all that's probably bad for jobs, um, but I think that, you know, being, if you're a technical person like us, you're in marketing or, or you're in project management, those sorts of things are going to be what's needed going forward. And I think those are the sorts of jobs, and we've talked about that before, haven't we, about, you know, the types of jobs that Web3 are, is likely to, um, you know, favour or come out with um, rather than, you know, the more traditional type stuff which, you know, people will go kicking and screaming to picket lines until they realise that, you know, it, over time it's, it's always been the same, you know, like when trains were invented, the people that made horse and carts, carts, you know, like that they weren't happy about that. So like it's, you know, and then and then cars came and train people weren't happy. So, you know, like it's uh, over the years there's been all of those sorts of things that, um, you know, people are going to have to adjust to and make adjustments for. And and this is just the start of, um, you know, of of mainstream moving into blockchain and into web three i thought there were two aspects that struck me about this article number one it's obviously everything we've said since episode zero we we could have written this article i think we did write this article but the fact that it's coming from google interested me like yes it was it was fine well and good when the small community creators understood the value of this you now have like that's about as big of a company as you're going to get google apple you know amazon netflix this is the top of the chain so they, they understand it. However, they're still looking at it as a cost savings. He's not talking about it as a way to create, you know, turning marketing costs into revenue, Mike, as you would put it. He's still talking about, oh, it's operational efficiency, which is how the yeah. corporates would think of it. But more interestingly, they're currently focused on applying it as blockchain solutions for digital identity, specifically, and supply chain. And this gets back to the problem, Mike, you've brought this up many times. Whose blockchain are we doing this on? How transparent and open is it? Like, there's a lot of devil in the details pieces here. I like that Google's pushing this. I agree with everything they have to say, but this is, it makes me a little bit nervous also because this is a company that's facing pressure, the whole chat GPT thing, model of search is changing, and now they've, they've got this blockchain thing in their sites. That's great. So this could help, this could hurt. I'm not sure. Uh, net, net, it's a positive. And I think that the fact that they're espousing the same principles of this program, I I, I love. But well, they I would they would treat this as another. Curve. Sorry. No, go ahead. I was going to say I think there's a steep learning curve coming for a lot of these companies, though. How so? Well, a lot of them have been in denial about even changing their, you know, even changing their tech stuff. Like they they need a a, a new set of skills to be able to integrate this into their current business processes. I mean, some of these people, you know, like they've only got their websites in the last five years, you know, like so they they were on the fence for, you know, the first five or ten years. And and if they do that with this, they're going to be so far behind. Um, so I think from that point of view, they're really going to have to start thinking about 
um, you know, how how they can, what kind of talent they need and how they can attract that talent. And conversely to that, I saw a, a ticker on something today that was saying that millennials are giving up their high paying um, tech jobs because they they want a, an easier life or they want to start their own passion projects or whatever. So if that's the case, then that's going to be a problem. I think that we are there and I think that Web3 opens up a hole in the corporate ladder that no one was prepared for at that level. And all of a sudden, people will work for companies because they want to, right? They, they There's a community feel or there's not. And that's going to determine a lot of those, especially the millennials. Mike, what are your so- thoughts? Look, look, look back at the beginning of this discussion when we talked about this technology being utilized as a tool, right? So you say your concern is the blockchain. So let's strip away all the all the noise and let's just focus on what exactly is the blockchain at its root level. It's a sequential list of data that is stored in a capacity where it's a, it's basically sequential, right? You can always reference things back. It's essentially the replacement of a multi-server farm. Uh, warehouse that Google has set up to run Google Cloud. So if you're a business and you're utilizing Google Cloud or you're a business and you're utilizing Google Blockchain, I ask you as the consumer slash the business in this case, what's the difference? None. None. But so from an operational down. operational perspective, right? Oh, that cost savings ton. that you were talking about Massive. from Google's perspective, you don't have to cool down this warehouse. You have a few nodes that are just executing these transactions instead of these entire server farms. This is revenue, you know, generated from marketing costs because you're marketing that sale that that sale out there as a sort of an alternative to the Google I, cloud. I, I would push back on that Mike. It's definitely revenue saved and it's not revenue generated by marketing, which is what you are doing. Your projects do that. Google's not making money from this. They're just not spending money that they would have to cool down those warehouses. They would totally make money from this the same way they would make money from Google cloud yeah. storage. It goes to the bottom line in the end. I agree with you. I'm, I'm picking, I'm splitting hairs, but I do think they're thinking of it as a cost savings device, not a community building device. Either way, it impacts the bottom line, which is the whole point of how this can evolve from the current setup that we have. Right. So again, this is going to take time. There's transitional elements to this that have to be onboarded. Just like if you watch, what was that? Uh, what was that Google movie back in the day um, where um, it, it, was, it was some funny the movie? Intern. Put, the intern. Okay, so remember at the end, you remember on you guys have been working together too long. On the line. I had no idea. I was going social network. <laughs> where, where we going with this? No, no, no. It's no. the intern. The so intern. at the end of the movie, spoiler alert, they have a project where they have to go out to local businesses and they have to convince the local businesses to buy ad spots on Google. So the guys go to this local pizza joint and they're like, no, we don't need this. You know, we have a great customer base, a loyal community that comes in every day. We go with our farmer's markets. We pick fresh tomatoes. We make it, you know, real Italian joint. No problem. We make great pizza. So everything's good to go. Well, what if we told you that we can get you triple the business? We don't want triple the business. Okay, well, what if we could just tell you that you're going to get more brand recognition that potentially you can sell your sauce as an external source of revenue? Sorry, that's the, the my devil dog. dogs are here. Oh, <laughs> it's a web three um, dog. Don't worry. So the the whole point is is that this was a technology that did not exist to businesses. They went in. And they actually said, hey, this is now available. Here's why it's beneficial. We're going to onboard you into this process. Google is at that phase right now, potentially with building the chain that they can ultimately sell things on. Now, I would like to see them put their money where their mouth is first and build the chain and get execute certain things of their own business on that chain to help prove that model. And I think we'll see that evolve over the next several years between them and Amazon. Would you of all people trust a Google chain? Absolutely not. But (laughs) would I also spend $100,000 to build my own if I'm an up-and-coming business? No. Absolutely not. So, I mean, I I can build my own server farm too, but unfortunately, it's just a little bit easier for me to trust in Google for now. Right. Yeah, I got you. You're right. It's going to be, but the devil is in the details, Mike, right? Don't you think? Again, I think that the technology provides a different component from what we're used to, right? We're not talking about them selling that data, you being able to utilize different advertising models at this point. Now, that will evolve, and they'll figure out ways to monetize from elements like that later on. Um, But I think that over time, the technology, as it evolves within the hardware devices, as we discussed several times, computers, phones, tablets, whatever devices we end up with, 
um, we're going to start seeing these technologies emerge as an internal business solution with the foundation to become that marketing driven force that can lead to that bottom line revenue for these smaller business capitalizing on the technology. I view that story in general as a, a good bookmark along the way. Like it's a good milestone that it's it's now being discussed at the top of the corporate world. And again, we still see people building, right? And this is this is the sign that things are still moving in the right direction. Good. All right, I'm taking us to the third story. Oh, hang on. Oh, so please. the best line from that movie, which we say all the time <laughs> because we're old, is, this, is if we when the Brits or you're not no John pancake. and I, my husband and I. We don't, because, you know, people go online. But in that movie, the guy is so old, he goes, on the line. So are we going on the line? So we'll quite often, <laughs> you know, I'll that. say, I'll say that, is our internet down? Are you on the line? <laughs> so, yeah, it's a little, it's kind of an in-joke, but it's very funny. It's a very funny line from that. My movie. vax is acting up here. Let me fix it. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And I'm sorry about my dog. John no, went worry. to pick up from the school. Is, He's stayed late back. and the dog's barking at the shadows, you know. Yeah, I had to put the dog back on, chain. All right. Yeah, so I had to put her on, chain. Third story. This will be Mike's favorite, I'm sure. Uh, this is coming to us off of Decrypt. One year after the merge, where does Ethereum stand? So before last year, Ethereum verified on-chain transactions, just like Bitcoin, proof of work consensus. They shifted it to, uh, to the, actually, they shifted it, and it's now validators, not miners, who have to pledge the Ethereum to secure the network. So that's the, that's the key thing that I think mo most people don't realize. But anyway, the price of Ethereum hasn't changed much, according to this article, roughly 1600 bucks. But underneath the hood, there's been a decrease in ETH, the supply of. The amount of Ethereum that's staked has about doubled. And of course, the carbon footprint, which is why they did this, declined almost 100%. So a lot's changing with Ethereum that many people probably don't appreciate. Mike, I'll let you lead this discussion since this is definitely your world. Yeah, so what you were referencing is they, they migrated from a proof of work model to what's called proof of stake, right? So these validators would have to stake X amount of Ethereum sort of as collateral in order to confirm the transactions accurately. And it led to less... Uh, less wasted gas fees, less less transactions just going unaccounted for. Um, it did not do much to the price. It didn't even do much to the price of gas, actually. Um, but what I think it did was it stabilized the primary chain in an effort to execute better transactions on some of the L2 chains. And this is why I wanted to throw this article in on today's topic, because the level twos that we've seen, the polygons, the arbitrums, the optimisms, these are becoming those loyalty rewards and those marketing chains. Mike, right? just so, for the nerd speak, what is level two, just for the folks, folks who don't know? So I'll put this uh, as the way I usually put it. Um, if you think of Ethereum as a highway, level two chains like Polygon, Optimism, these are, the, these are the service roads, okay. right? So, you know, it, it goes kind of along the same line as the highway. Um, it's part of the highway. Uh, you can operate directly on that highway without operating on the primary highway. Um, but without the primary highway, it's just a road. It's not a service road. Um, and it most likely won't exist. So the sustainability of those L2s are only contingent on the primary foundation of Ethereum. Right. So if you can solidify the building of Ethereum and make sure that that system is not only economically feasible from the transaction perspective, but fast, reliable um, and then obviously, you know, carbon footprints and, and, and environmentally friendly with the amount of energy consumption that it takes to validate one of these transactions. Now you're talking about a much stronger L2 platform that we can that we are seeing emerge, I, I would argue, 100 percent over the last year. Um, we've seen Polygon explode. We've seen other projects migrate over to Polygon. A lot of these reward systems and these multi-transactional systems that you know require a lot of interaction between these users and a lot of transactions between different tokens are being conducted on Polygon versus Ethereum, mostly due to the transactional costs associated with that. And as long as you can remain liable that or reliable that that chain that side chain is going to be strong it's only as big and as strong as ethereum michelle you've been involved in the in the whole nft world for quite a while what's your take on this change with ethereum so a couple of interesting things one was that the one of the huge criticisms of ethereum before this was about how much it cost um not just in not in terms of transaction costs but how much it costs to actually create the ethereum and so you know there were people that were saying that oh you know like it was it was uh, 
expensive in terms of generating of electricity and all of that stuff. And and by doing this, they drop that by they they say it's around ninety nine percent. So for for the green people out there that were wanting to be in Web three, that was important for them. Um, and so that was that was one of the one of the reasons one of the drivers for doing it as well. Secondly, an interesting thing um, is that usually when this sort of stuff happens, and I know it's a little bit different to like a, a, in the in terms of the share market, a consolidation or a split. Like we've when we've owned shares in the past, for example, like if you own a share that was ten dollars and they do a two for one. Um, so now you now they're worth five dollars, but you've got double the amount. What has happened a lot on the Australian market is that over the next six to twelve months, the price of that share goes from five back up to ten. Because, and I don't know if that's similar, Mark. You would know for the New York Stock Exchange or whatever. But what happens is it. Ninety nine times out of a hundred, that happens. So it's been interesting for me to see that the price of Ethereum, and I know that there weren't more shares and that sort of thing, but this kind of thing, or if it's forked, you know, people kind of tend to think it's a good thing, and usually the price goes up. Now it hasn't, but we have, but it's around about the same. So it hasn't dived either, given what's happened over the last twelve months with the price of cryptocurrencies and all the FTX fallout and all of that. So that's the second thing. The third thing is, is a question for Mike. The fact that there's so much more staking now, I feel is a reflection of the market that we've got at the moment. People aren't wanting to necessarily sell it or move around or reinvest into other cryptocurrencies and whatever. Staking basically means you put your tokens into a pool and they earn you um, a return but you're not actually transacting on your tokens. Um, that's correct, right? So like a savings account. You have interest yes, on like your savings, savings account. savings account. That's right. And if you keep in your money in the savings account for 90 days, you earn a certain amount of interest. Then you've got to reinvest for another 90 days. And effectively, you can't touch it. Otherwise, you lose your, you lose your bonus interest or whatever. So it's like that. So I think that it shows that there are people who are still – interested in the the currency market the cryptocurrency market but they're not doing what they might have done 12 to 18 months ago which is you know buy peppy coin and buy dogecoin and put it over here and do it over there and moving it around all the time so i think that that shows that there's some consolidation and some foundation in ethereum by having a lot more staked than I would necessarily have thought at the beginning of it. I wouldn't. I wouldn't necessarily think that that's the root cause of it. I would. I would argue that a the majority of the stakings are from these validators, right? So the Ethereum sure. network made it so that if you didn't stake X amount, then you did not have the ability to receive the compensation from validating yeah, these sure. transactions. Yeah. The other component of it is how many of these people bought Ethereum when it was thirty five hundred bucks. And they're just staking it now because if they sell it, they're obviously at a much, much, you know, a pretty significant yeah. loss. So yeah. they're banking on the model of everything going back. But just like every just like traditional banking, right? If the three of us have all the money in the world and we bank at one bank and we say, OK, you hold on to all of our money and we're technically staking it into the savings or this IRA account or whatever. And then come January 2nd of 2024, the three of us collectively get together and pull out all the cash. What happens to the bank? Yeah. Bye bye. So <laughs> if everybody pulls out their staked ETH, what yeah. happens to ETH? So yeah. to, to, to technically, you wouldn't be allowed to pull all that money out of the bank. <laughs> but that's another story. Well, they'd probably get bailouts because that's what we do here. But so um, this is my takeaway, Mike. I thought that the this sharpens the distinction between ETH and Bitcoin, right? This speaks to why do people own these things? And you're talking about it right now, but you're, everything you just commented on, people are still buying crypto to make money. And when they can't make money, to your point, Michelle, they do other stuff with it to make money, staking it. But right now, with this, these changes, so just off the top of my head, the proof of stake is ETH, right? Proof of work is Bitcoin. But you've got a more useful ecosystem with ETH now, whereas Bitcoin is still a singular use currency, basically. Uh, ETH attracts more uh, support in terms of all these level twos. They're going to build around it. It's a larger, it's a larger community, if you will. 
Whereas again, Bitcoin is very static. And the folks that own Ethereum know it's much more flexible, right? It's more useful now with NFTs. It can be used as, whereas Bitcoin is pretty much like they can try the ordinals all they want, but primarily the network is slow. It's just not as scalable. And ETH has proven itself to be useful for this thing. Bitcoin and Ethereum are oftentimes mentioned in the same sentence. They are radically different. And I think yeah. the more time goes by, people will start to realize that they're not, one is in, an investment vehicle, if you will, and the other is not. It could be. And again, it all these be. are things that could be, right? So if you want to compare the two in in its most basic form, um, you know, Bitcoin is a movie theater and Ethereum is YouTube, right? So, you know, on YouTube, you have user generated content that can obviously be promoted on that same platform versus, uh, you know, a movie theater, which is subjected to, you know, one or two, or in some cases, multiple different types of the same content, right? So, you know, it's not user generated content that's promoted in these movie theaters, right? That's the point. So I think Ethereum stood out in the, in the customized approach, the ability for people to, you know, play around with different artistic concepts, gamified concepts, uh, whereas Bitcoin was very strict. This is what we are. These are the boundaries and nobody's going to be able to touch it. Um, which is great. I mean, again, they can both mutually exist and they have, um, you know, we have seen trends that when Bitcoin goes up, Ethereum follows. And when Ethereum goes down, Bitcoin follows. We have seen waves where, you know, they don't necessarily go up or down mutually exclusive. Um, and that's just due to the crypto market in, in its nature. Right. I mean, you know, there's certain stocks that when they go up, the market is hot. Um, you know, it, but in both cases, they're all stocks. Right. I think that Bitcoin this might be controversial, but I believe Ethereum is built for today. It is extremely useful. It is very functional. Bitcoin is built for the tomorrow that hasn't gotten here yet. And you can I, again, I, I don't think one necessarily needs to exist without the other. I think they both could equally exist. Coke and Pepsi exist, right? I mean, that's the same product in a different, in a different model, right? That's my point, though. I don't think we're talking Coke and Pepsi. I think we're talking apples and oranges. It's, it's possibly... It, but apples and oranges can exist in the same ecosystem, right? So you can use Bitcoin can as a bridge. Both. You can use Bitcoin as a bridge to interact with components of Ethereum. And there's going to be technologies allow, that allow that possibility to happen without bridging the currency into that other chain, right? We're going to start seeing those cross-chain pollinations as far as the transaction. You know, we're already starting to see that with Chainlink and some of these other technologies that have emerged. But again, if Bitcoin wants to just simply be the, the, the currency chain and focus their efforts on the investment side of things, and again, we're using these terms in conversational purposes only, and if Ethereum could be that and much more, they can coexist, right? That's There's going to be people that you know, participate in either, either one exclusively or both because they understand what both can operate with. I think I agree with you for now. And I think that these things are eternal. Don't forget we're we're Ethereum is going to be used in a radically different way than Bitcoin will ultimately. And I think that it detracts a different type of person. That's the only thing I was going to mention. So you say that Bitcoin is for tomorrow. It's obviously, you know, older than Ethereum. It's been around and it's, it has more practical, you know, commercial use case today, I would argue than Ethereum does. Ethereum is more of a blank canvas to build other pieces that could potentially have that. So Bitcoin was built in you, response to concerns around the money system and yeah. financial interests. Ethereum was not. Ethereum, Ethereum built, could be, though. It could, it, it, could be. it could be other things, too. So if you had to select one that outlives the other, which one would you choose? Uh, Bitcoin, hands down. And here's why. I could be wrong I'm predicting. Bitcoin can't be printed. Okay. But the problem I have with that, though, is that if, say, for instance, the world currency just decided that we would all have Bitcoin and no one would have any other currencies or whatever, there's not enough of them. That's the point of it. That is exactly why it was invented. You can't devalue the money. No, and I'm not but... Saying, that's why they hate it. That's why, and I'm not, all I'm getting at, like, we, no one knows anything. I don't know any more than anyone else knows. The functional purpose of the one is very different from the functional purpose of the other. And because of that, it attracts yes, a different true. kind of a person. It's but like a I car. Think it, it, correct. And you could have a pickup truck and a motorcycle. Bingo. Right? So, I mean, both serve different purposes and they could both attract the same person. Yeah, I right. for, for a while, for a while. But I think part of right now is the attraction of different people is the price because, you know, how many Ethereum can I buy for 
one Bitcoin and I might not ever be able to afford to buy one Bitcoin. You don't know that. I, I, no, I think but is- if I look, if I looked at the current prices, though, if I was, you know, mathematically okay, so- over a long enough time, though, Bitcoin will only go up in value just because of it. Sure. Because I mean, of theoretically, they both should. They should. Right. If if more level twos well are being, linked, aren't they? They, now, they are linked in the marketplace. Right. And, you know, that's what I meant earlier about they both go up or down, you know, pretty much in sync in some some sort of a tandem, not an exact ratio. But um, I, I think that with 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 the way that Bitcoin is laid out as it compares to Ethereum. Yes, there's limited supply. Yes, there's currency potential with it. But um, I, I would argue that if one were to die, it would have a massive impact on the other as well. Before we get down the rabbit hole of currencies, et cetera, I want to throw our honorable mention article out here. Can you mind if I jump? It's important. <laughs> we have to. For those who didn't see in TechCrunch, this is one I picked. But the, the news is that Mila Kunis and Ashton Kutcher's Stoner Cats NFTs gets smoked by the SEC. So the SEC has charged an animated TV series with selling NFTs as shockingly unregistered securities. Stoner Cats sold 10,000 NFTs at 800 bucks a pop, roughly and fans get exclusive access to the six-episode animated series. This is exactly how these things should be used, in my opinion. They are settling with the SEC for the million-dollar fine. It involves celebrities Jane Fonda, Chris Rock, Seth MacFarlane. Here's the mistake, though, I think. Stoner Cats emphasized that quote when they were pitching it. The more successful the show, the more successful your NFTs will be, end quote. I think that's what did them in. What are you guys' thoughts on this? Michelle, we'll start with you. I, I I found it mildly, probably mo- probably not mildly, probably hilariously amusing that they that they uh, the SEC put one of the memes which is listed in the article in their court papers as proof that they were <laughs> as proof that they were you know shilling the product as a as a an investment or something. Oh, it's like honestly, um, yeah, I don't. <laughs> I don't know. As you said, this is really the how how they should use NFTs to raise funds for movies, for independent filmmakers, stuff like that. Like there was a there was a big theme at NFT NYC, and I think I spoke about it the week after when I got back for you know people um, funding you know funding independent art projects which the Netflix or the Fox Studios or whatever of this world would never ever fund and they do they're doing that by selling NFTs to them and you know like the the director of the Blair Witch Project was there um and he had an NFT series for projects that he's working on I like I I see that as a perfect way in which a community can be built around a particular project um and I I don't know yeah, I don't yeah, know. I think the SEC, if they keep this up, they are going to be, until the next millennia, they are going to be busy. Yep. I um, think that's their goal. Prosecuting people. Mike, what do you think about this? Stoner cats. Well, let me, I, I haven't read the terms of conditions or, or the policies or whatever, but um, what about a Kickstarter campaign? How does that fit into SEC regulations? What Go about funding. a GoFundMe? What about any of these various platforms that you can support? I'm going to play devil's advocate because that's what I like to do with you. If I buy into the GoFundMe or I do a Kickstarter camp, you know, you're doing and I give you money. I don't expect my money. I'm not holding an item that's going to go up in value. Absolutely. You are a hundred percent. You are, you can have a first rights of specific products that are launched within the Kickstarter. You can have exclusive rights on various drops that occur in the future of that company. If assuming they, 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 they survive, you're basically one of the first investors into the concept of the product, so right? Rights Some, might be it, securities according to the SEC's. So I, I, look, I, I, I think the, I agree with you in the mistake that they made as far as proclaiming that people would be able to make money as the value of the product goes up. And I think that brands need to be very careful with that type of language. Right. And, you know, I, I, I feel like I talked about this story all week because, you know, there's elements of it that I. Th- oh, losing Mike. We lost you on that one. Mike's internet is uh, dodgy. What I was going to say was that, you know, some of those Kickstarter things, they say that you'll get sent one of the first products. We lost yeah. you for a second, Mike. Mike, you, yeah, I know. you dropped out. I might drop out again. That's right. As it seems. Um, so, yeah, we got a bad storm here. So, the uh, 
the the component of making money and explaining to people that the better that we do the better that you do now now you're getting into a dangerous territory right where if you just let the market play itself out you know nike came out with a pair of shoes they sold them for 50 bucks some of them are worth a thousand right now right multi you know tens of thousands right now that's the market kind of like setting the the precedent of whatever the the product is at that given at that given but stage. Nike wasn't saying if this project works your shoes could, could go up in value. Correct. And that's the hype, the FOMO, the hot air in the balloon that was at the beginning of this entire endeavor that is really coming back to bite people in in the butt right now. But I will in 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 Stoner Cat's defense and you know, I have one. So, you know, uh, full <laughs> disclosure. Um, the NFT or the wow. NFT? The <laughs> NFT. Um, the, the thing that I am not too concerned about here is that this is just another case of a government entity that has no regulations or no definitions of what the hell is going on, shoveling shit against the wall to see what will stick and really flexing muscles to either see who will fight back at which point they get the publicity they're looking for or who pays the fine and they get their hand in the cookie jar. So I think that um, in this case, they paid the fine. They kind of went their separate ways. They did what they had to do. Case closed. They're going to go after some of these bigger fish, but I don't see them you know, hiring all these different entities to prosecute smaller projects because you know, they, did, you know, they, they did NFTs or they have digital collectibles. This is nothing new. There's memberships out there. There's courses out there. There's value propositions that can operate within a business, and the government can't come in and just say, hey, because we think it's this, this is what you're, you know, we have to do. There's no, there's no case law. There's no speculation. Uh, there's no regulation in place right now but for I think any that's of this. What they've been doing consistently since, and since they don't seem to be winning in the crypto thing, a la Ripple, they're doing it now for NFTs. But what have they won in the NFTs? They haven't won anything other than settlements. Yes, they have. They've. they've what have won, they? They have the scare factor of people not willing to do the pro projects right now. Okay, so that's my point, right? So in the end, don't you feel they lose in that capacity too? Because now they're not getting their cut. Well, they weren't. Hold on a second. We've we've argued from the beginning. Crypto and, and in general, like blockchain as a business, ends up going somewhere else if it's not welcomed here or anywhere. I think that that's what the it's at stake here. However, the SEC has been pretty uniform in the fact that they feel that they have a right to control, and and when they can't, they sue. Okay, so, so do you feel that the SEC is working in conjunction with the IRS in this, or are they mutually exclusive? Uh, no, I think there's warring factions going on in, in the United States with this. So you think they're working against each other? No, I think everybody wants a piece of the money. Yes, they are in conjunction that there's money to be had and we all get a piece of it. They're not in conjunction as to who's the boss in terms of regulating. Because this could well be the yeah. IRS department. It could well be the CFTC. It, the SEC, Either way, the cookie that's taken out of the cookie jar lands where? It lands in wh whosoever jurisdiction these things are deemed to actually be as an It item. lands in the government is yeah. the point the government's Agreed. getting their their take and whatever entity takes it it should be irrelevant but again when mm. you go down the rabbit hole and maybe this will happen with vayner i don't know right i mean they've really pulled back from the whole nft lingo of i things. can see why right and I, gary's a smart guy this has got to be his number one concern around I, and i understand that but is he the type of guy that would pay the fine and move on or would he set a precedent and try to set the stage that this is a technology that's here to stay and we're going to fight this all the way up to the supreme my, my court opinion and I, i'm the latter. I would yeah. hope so. But uh, that's I, a I cost think, on I him. I think this is all opinion again, but I think that Gary is the owner and operator of multiple businesses and has a lot at stake and would simply just chalk this one up. Yeah, but uh, a million dollar fine to him, for example, is nothing if he was to fight the Web3 cause because he is committed to it. Uh, okay, you really Look, want this, to be on on, on the crusade? You remember when Howard Stern tried to oppose the FCC? I mean, this is yeah, this was old and good Howard Stern, not crazy woke ridiculous I'm just saying, Howard you, you Stern. You cannot now. if the government puts you in their sights, a la Andrew Tate, love my sure. hand, whatever. You're you're sure. not going to win. So I don't think Gary's up for becoming the the, the martyr here. I mean, I disagree. I think you you can win. 100% you can win. And again, if you have to pay the fine, you pay the fine. You play ball. Pharma does it all day long. They'll sell a drug that's hundreds of... Yeah, I get your point, Mike. You're right. And then they just decide it's a business cost. They'll pay the fine and move yeah, on. Yeah, which He's we right. talked about that last week, I think. I, I Mike, still, all right, so then Mike this is the Storm first is causing havoc. He'll be yeah, back. I, 
I don't think I would want to be taking on the government and on the cause of any Web3 or anything for that matter. Because That's it's just, because you're a cautious ex-Wall Street. <laughs> perhaps. But I think if I was, Mike, I got your point, though, about Big Pharma. I agree with you. I just think that it's a lot to ask for anyone to be the martyr in as the Web3 lead horse. That's going to Somebody's going to fight this. Somebody's yes, going to fight this. I, I agree. Okay, 100%. And in the Web3 space right now, he would be the most logical choice. He's not big enough. Oh, I don't know about that. In the Web3 space, he's about as big as they come. Clearly, I'm getting censored here. Government. <laughs> Wait, what was that? Clearly, I'm getting censored. Every time I open my mouth, I, I you know, I freeze the up. The SEC is working overtime to clip Mike's wires right now, everybody. Look, right. somebody will fight this all the way Is up to the Supreme tech? Court. That is for sure. Okay. Like, but I've again, actually... if you make 10 million bucks and you got a fine of a million bucks and that's the operating cost of doing business, there will be yes. a ton of people that settle that. Michelle, yes. I can share with you that I'm secretly dropping Mike from the feed here when I don't like what he says. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've got an exit <laughs> button on your little keypad. Yeah, you're, secret, you're secretly SEC and, it's and a IRS. Good conversation. I know it. We're at time. When you weren't here, Mike, I said that Mark was his conservative ex Wall Street man. Yeah. I, I said that I wouldn't want to take on the government, and she's upset about that. <laughs> Look, nobody wants to. Nobody wants a fight that they, you know, that they don't need. Some people have to. But again, if you're trying to set a precedent for an industry, right, which is still brand new, and Gary's in a great position to do that. Now, I, I look, I, again, I, I think he's a smart guy. I think that he doesn't want the headaches or the costs associated too. But And either way you look at it, he's going to be on the Mount Rushmore of NFTs when it, when, when, when it's built. Um, you know, the irony here, though, is that when Michelle and I got on the uh, – setting up the stream here before you jumped on, Mike, I, I, she's like, what are you listening to? And I'm like, oh, it's Rage Against the Machine. <laughs> Yeah, well, look at them now. They're, they're, they are the machine. They're not even raging against it anymore. All right. We're at time. like We're over time. I'm going to uh, go around last thoughts around this. I'll, I'll lead us off because I want to wrap it up. But I do. it's an interesting conversation. We should probably pick it up. Um, real quickly, Web3 is changing marketing. Whether people know it or not, and this is not my opinion, companies are acting a little differently. People are expectations are shifting. They want community. They want conversation two ways. This is bigger than just me getting on social media and blasting united because they broke my guitar they now expect interaction and personality i also think that the fact google was discussing this now google of all companies like wants to is focused on how web3 can help them great and the ethereum story is always interesting like they are really building a serious community that is proving the use cases it's durable it's scalable it's they're preparing for the future michelle mike what do you guys think I think that we've talked before about marketing is changing, is becoming more sophisticated. People are not as gullible, most people, are not as gullible as they used to be and being sold and sold directly at doesn't work anymore and there are a lot of brands who are going to be dragged kicking and screaming to building the community line. Um, and, you know, I think it's going to be painful for some and for those that find it easy and embrace it, they'll reap the rewards of that. Mike, final thoughts? It's a tool. Learn how to operate the tool efficiently and it will work wonders for you. Make your life a little easier. Make your community build a little bit stronger. Um, maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but at some point in the near future, this will become a valued asset that you can provide as, a, as an element of revenue and as a marketing strategy that you can incorporate year after year within your business. Thank you very much for listening, everybody. We'll take a moment to just say that none of this is meant as investment advice to your own research. We come to you every week. Friday, I'm sorry, Wednesdays at 4 o'clock on LinkedIn, uh, Bolt Plus, and YouTube. And the purpose of this show, the Web 3x3 podcast, is to bring a business discussion around blockchain and marketing specifically and how entrepreneurs and businesses can use these tools to make money, build community, and grow their business. So we thank you guys for joining us. As always, Linda, uh, Caleb, all the usuals, we're, we're grateful for the attention. We thank you guys for sticking with us. We'll be back again next week, 4 p.m. Eastern time. Peace, everybody. Bye. Have a good one.